drug dealers are increasingly turning to pimping. Why? Because drugs you can only sell once, children you can sell over and over again. Every year the Super Bowl attracts one of the largest human sex trafficking problems in the world. A lot of trafficking in kids. We're told summer force begin working as early as 12 years old. The numbers are staggering. It is estimated that across this country there is as many as 300,000 youngsters. These are young kids between the ages of 12 and 18 who are part of this sexual enslavement going on in this country. The, the number one place for kids to be picked up is malls, movie theaters. Um, so where kids congregate and parents typically will drop them off. It's basic economics. You know, wherever there's a demand, there will be a supply. We really do need to address the demand. Mm -hmm. uh, the majority of buyers are men. The majority of buyers are college educated men. The majority of buyers also represent homogeneous ethnic group and they have the money and the means and the mentality to purchase sex with children. And they told her that it all started with their porn consumption, moved them towards the acceptability of having sex with children and within one year of beginning to watch that kind of pornography they were actually seeking out children to act out with. One year. So that progression is a part of it. Where there is a demand there will be suppliers. Uh, perpetrators will tell children what they think they want to hear or need to hear and they know developmentally how to target kids at different stages and ages so a lot of times young people struggle with you know well they said it was you know it's going to be my fault if this happens or that happens and so there's this real imbalance and power shift and kids a lot of times are left very confused thinking it's their fault or you know they're really not that bad or this you know, it's very confusing because most of the time the person that, that does this is someone they love. You can't flip a light switch and they stop loving them. They just want it to be a different kind of love, a different relationship where it's an unconditional love, not one where the child is losing a part of themselves because they're being abused. So a lot of times it's undoing um, the, the grooming that's taken place. It's the most corrosive part of any type of abuse case is undoing the emotional grooming that takes place. The majority of sex trafficking victims are runaways. That means 20% of kids who run away will be victims of sex trafficking during their runaway period. 68% of kids who run are coming out of the foster yeah. care system. So that broken system is not a, always a good place and sometimes it's the only place for children to be placed. Mm -hmm. um, law enforcement has had a real struggle when it comes to the capacity to extract a child from sex trafficking and then where do we place them? Mm -hmm. What do we do with them? If it's a bad home situation and they can't go home and what does it take back to that house? How, how does a parent cope yeah. with all of those things? case actually um, this last year where we had a young person that was caught up in a sexual abuse case with a family member. And lots of issues for this young person and um, she decided she didn't want to stay in the home where she, she was having a hard time adjusting after all the abuse. So she ran away and this was to, in the Burleson area so she was at a restaurant and she got picked up at the restaurant and left with some guys that then held her captive and so the whole thing was they were she was getting ready to be trafficked and prostituted out by uh, this particular group were Fort Worth affiliated gang members that were going to traffic her out for prostitution and they had her for probably I want to say about two weeks before we were able to get her located and get her back and then of course we had to interview her again um, and it so it compounded the issues we were already working with her on because she was sexually assaulted so many times by so many different people within that time frame. It's not just gangs or pimps who are suppliers. It can also be family. And then we have our domestic trafficking. Here is more what we see at the advocacy centers. We've had fathers that will pimp out their daughters and, and the kids could tell us, you know, for this much I had to 
provide a blow job for this it was full intercourse for this it was this and could just tell me the here's the price sheet this is this is the price tag my dad put on me I'm posting stories all the time there was one story that I put up about a six-year-old who was the family's cash cow it was because they were selling her for pornography trafficked and abused children will most likely end up prostitutes but I'll tell you that the majority of women who are being engaged in prostitution were trafficked as children because the average age of entry is 13. If you ask them, they started as a kid. Well, that means that they were prostituted by somebody. Yeah. There was a demand by somebody. That every single woman they have worked with and helped to rehabilitate, etc. Upon interviewing them and learning about their lives, their background, their lifestyle, what pulled them into the sex trade, they've realized there's not a single woman that they've worked with who has either worked in prostitution or um, stripping, etc., that hasn't been trafficked into it, that hasn't been in some way forced into it, that hasn't had some form of, of abuse, of um, coercion, etc. Um, so every single one of these women, um, even though they oftentimes come into it thinking, this was my decision, they end up through counseling, through rehabilitation, realizing, oh, when I was 14, this man who was 20 years my senior convinced me to do this and convinced me to do this and that led into my lifestyle of this and so it's these patterns of abuse um, that we see with every single one of these women. So what happens next? Is there any hope for the victims? Most of our kids do have PTSD because it's been a pretty traumatic um, interruption of their childhood. So just trying to help them process again the issues surrounding it and just over exaggerating like a zero. This is how much it's your fault. This is how much it's your fault. You know, you need to understand this is how much it's your fault. And just going through that over and over again. And so on the restoration, it sounds like it's private groups, not the government. Am I correct on that? Absolutely. Okay. The effective prosecution of child abuse cases has been increased by over 70% by the implementation of our team. So we think that's pretty pretty amazing. The way that specifically where I help and serve um, is with an offshoot of the net called Purchased. Um, and Purchased works to rehabilitate women who have been victims of sex trafficking or have been in the sex industry. There's a judge in Fort Worth who watched the cycle of women being arrested for prostitution and going to jail and being released and then being arrested right over again. Um, and and he realized that what they needed more than prison time was help being removed from the lifestyle they were in um, and being removed from the sex industry that they had been forced into. As they're being removed from this lifestyle, they realize that to have any ties to their old lifestyle just pulls them back in. So they're having to make completely new friends. They're having to sometimes sever from family, sometimes sever from old friends. Um, and so making completely new sets of friends is definitely the hardest thing, but the most important thing. Um, so that's really my job is to meet these women, learn about their lives, become their friends, and be the support system that they need so that hopefully they won't return to their former lifestyle. The best way to help victims is from preventing it from ever happening in the first place. We start with prevention. Mm -hmm. Preventing the demand, that means that we have to educate people where this demand is coming from, who are the buyers, the consumers, who are the ones who are trafficking, how can we prevent this issue, what are the things that we can do. General citizenry should be able to say, I understand the signs of trafficking, if I see something I'm going to say something, and my intervention might be a call to 911 if I think someone's in imminent danger. Some of the signs include fearful of police or strangers, signs of physical or emotional abuse, or limited access to medical care. For a complete list of the signs, please go to trafficstop.org. But one of the really big things that the NET does is um, there's a woman who is, I think she's the assistant director of the program. Her name is Sarah. And she'll go from school to school, sometimes with other um, volunteers at the NET as well. And she will talk to kids in high schools about human trafficking, both the dangers of it um, and how to avoid it yourself and also what these teens in schools can do to help fight it themselves and so she'll just go give talks especially in inner city um, schools where kids are more at risk for being victims of trafficking just to tell them what to be wary of what to watch for um, and how to be safe something really important to us is prevention work because 
by the time we get a hotline report or a child comes through the front door of the center, we're reacting to something that's already happened. And our goal is to stop it from ever happening in a child's life. So we have a, a program called Before You Click, and it's the first in the U.S. of its type where we set up um, a website where teachers actually have a resource portal where they can go in and pull down lesson plans that are wrapped around online safety, um, talking about abuse, bullying, um, all those types of things. And so it meets all the TEKS criteria, Texas, Educa Texas Education Knowledge and Skills, and the STAR testing. Um, and the, the schools, by legislative mandate, have to talk about bullying, how to report abuse, and online safety. So those things are all wrapped in there. So if a teacher needs a lesson plan, um, we have it on reading comprehension, we have it on math and science, so they can pull down any of those resources. And for the, there's videos, so younger kids, there's animated videos. Older kids, it's more intense. We have, I think, three of our teenage films um, in production right now. This is a newer program for us, so the, the website is in ongoing development, but we have launched it through Cleveland School Districts. We meet with Burleson Friday afternoon at 2. We're meeting with the parents, the PTO in Burleson. So, but the cool thing that makes it unique for the United States is that we were, we were talking about how kids communicate, and everything's through their cell phones, through technology, and the reporting process that's in place is so intimidating that kids you know they have to go tell somebody these horrific things that have happened to them and it's and it's private and it's embarrassing and it's you know they just they don't want the whole world to know what happened to them so we're trying to think of a way that kids could report in a way that wouldn't really put the spotlight on them so every page on the web, website has a report abuse icon so kids are learning about the website at school because of the lesson plans that are being being done through school and little kids can get on there and play games and every time they go up a level they have to answer a safety question before they can go up. So everything is geared towards safety. But every page has the report abuse icon and you click on it and it will say is this report about you or somebody else and it has drop down boxes so if it's bullying typically they're going to send an email, we're going to get it, we're going to call the school counselor and make sure that that child has someone that's intervening on their behalf and helping. But if a child says sexual abuse has occurred as they tick the boxes, that report goes to the Johnson County Sheriff's Office dispatch. And it, and it even goes down, to, and it's real simple questions, but it talks about where's the best place to talk to him, at home or at school. Because if mom or dad are the perpetrator, we don't want to show up at the house. So if they click at school, then we can show up at school and um, whatever agency that needs to talk to them can talk to them at that point in time and do a screening. But that way, they can just sit at the computer and they can do it. And they can do it in their own time where they feel comfortable and it comes through. But at third point, they really need help, but they're having a hard time publicly saying they need that. Then we feel like this is going to be a tremendous tool in helping us find kids that feel like they don't have a voice right now. This is an issue that we need to take ownership of. Because until we take personal responsibility, we're not going to do anything about it. So when it comes to the footprint of individuals, there's an awesome website. It's called slaveryfootprint.org. But it asks you about your clothing to the point where you're able to say, you know, what kind of leather shoes do I have? And just down into the weeds. And then it asks you about your food consumption. And then based on its algorithms and calculations and a knowledge base that they've acquired over years of research, they're able to tell you an estimate of how many slaves work for you to have those things. This, this is so massive, law enforcement will never be able to curb this and it's going to take everybody standing up and saying, only you can prevent worse. Only you can prevent sex trafficking. Are you, Are you doing, doing your, your part? part?